All right, well, hello and welcome. We are so glad that you are joining us tonight for our program, The Chickadee's Guide to Gardening, Why Native Plants Matter for Pollinators and Songbirds. My name is Kim Noyce. I'm the Education Coordinator at First Light Powers Northfield Mountain Recreation and Environmental Center. It is my pleasure to host the program this evening. This event is co-sponsored by the Northfield Bird Club and Northfield Mountain. It is a bird club tradition for the Northfield Club that each program begins with poetry. The founder and director of the club, Nick Fleck, sent two poems to share this evening. And of course, they are about chickadees. The black-capped chickadee is our Massachusetts state bird and a favorite bird to watch at our feeders. These poems are by Ralph Waldo Emerson. And the first one is titled, The Chickadee. Piped a tiny voice hard by, gay and polite, a cheerful cry. Chick, chickadee dee, saucy note, out of a sound heart and a merry throat. As if it said, good day, good sir, fine afternoon, old passenger. Happy to meet you in these places when January brings new faces. And as some background for the following poem, in 1845, Henry David Thoreau built his cabin on Walden Pond, on land owned by his good friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this poem is by Emerson from Fragments on Nature. In Walden Wood, the chickadee runs round the pine and maple tree, intent on insect slaughter. O oh, tufted entomologist, devour as many as you list, then drink in Walden water. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Desiree Narango. Dr. Narango studies how plants and animals interact with each other, their environment, and with us. Most of her work takes place in novel landscapes significantly altered, altered by people, such as urban forests, residential yards, and farmland. Her ultimate goal is to find data-driven conservation solutions for land managers to help preserve biodiversity in a rapidly changing world. Dr. Narango is currently the David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellow at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Dr. Narango received her PhD from the University of Delaware, where her research focused on the effects of non-native plants on food webs and residential landscapes. She has held past research positions for various government organizations and academic institutions in the United States, the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. Her research topics have ranged from migration ecology and urban forests, to interactions between bumblebees and cavity nesting birds, and the ecology of residential yards. Thank you, Desiree, for joining us this evening. To our audience, for anyone who has just joined us, please use the question and answer tool that you will find on the top right of your screen. It's a question mark icon. If you hover it over it with your mouse, it will say show Q&A. Please type in your questions and we will moderate and keep track of them and then ask them at the end of the program. Thanks again, Desiree, and I'll pass the presentation to you. Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, that was great. I love that poem so much. <laughs> I, I love it so much. I, uh, I uh, actually have that on my website too, because it's a great um, theme for my research in general, um, our, our little tufted entomologist of a chickadee. Um, so, uh, let's see, is this going to let me go ahead? Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in here tonight, and I'm really excited to have this opportunity for you to listen to me, um, and, and talk to you a little bit about this research that I've been doing for, uh, the last, um, 
10 years, around five, 10 years or so, um, and talk to you a little bit about what um, this little chickadee has taught me about uh, ecology in uh, residential landscapes, um, and also what this little bird has taught me about how we can participate in personal conservation action through the way that we cultivate our plant communities. And so, um, you know, as Kim mentioned, uh, my work uh, kind of, it, it focuses on interactions, um, not just among animals and their habitat, but also how they interact with people. And so these, these habitats that I mostly work on is, is what I call human dominated landscapes. And, and if you think about it, these landscapes are basically everywhere because we've uh, dramatically and rapidly transformed the world to support a growing population. We, we develop urban and suburban areas. We, we make farmland. We make uh, energy infrastructure. Uh, we manage timberland. All of these sort of places um, we have to develop so that we can support our growing population. Um, but with that comes really uh, drastic effects on habitat quality for wildlife. And, that, and that's really where um, my research program um, kind of focuses on. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, we're facing dramatic losses of biodiversity around the globe. Um, and importantly, we're also facing extinction of nature experiences in every generation. Each generation can identify trees or, 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 or insects or appreciate uh, the, the plant and animal wildlife around us. And so uh, our, our grand challenge, um, not just as an ecologist and a scientist, which is what I am, um, but our grand challenge as the global public is to really ask the question of how can we share our world with biodiversity, but also simultaneously support people and also inspire them uh, to care as well. And so that, that's the question that really drives me in, in all of my work. And so um, I would argue that we, we can't really have successful conservation unless we incorporate privately managed land. Um, and that's why a lot of my work has really focused on these residential landscapes as a conservation opportunity um, across the world. Um, I mean, across the United States, more than 60% of it is considered privately owned. And there's some estimates that for the lower 48, 10 to 15 percent uh, of the United States is developed for residential areas alone. And and if we go into an urban area like Springfield, Massachusetts or, or in New York City, we see that uh, the residential areas that we developed is making up more than 50 percent of the green space that um that are in these urban areas. And so um, to be able to manage these these areas for wildlife habitat is a real it's a real challenge because uh, the decisions that are made in our yards um, and in the air, in the land that we owned are made by uh, millions of different parcel owners each making decisions based on their own needs or values it's not a, a land manager managing a forest for for wood thrush it's it's you managing your yard for the things that you, that you care about and the things that you need but um you know what i'm what i'm gonna uh argue today is that we can we can support people and we can also support wildlife um in our residential land and so uh one of the major decisions um that people can make on their land is uh what what sort of plants to have on their property and um, these small landscaping decisions um, can make really big differences. So from the trees that were left behind when your neighborhood was originally developed uh, to the, the ones that were cut down, the ones that you planted in its place, uh, the designer gardens and pollinator gardens that you create and how many different times that you mow, um, each one of those seemingly small decisions um, has had, had the real additive effect of completely transforming the plant communities, their diversity, their identity, and their structure um, has, has completely changed these plant communities that have survived to occupy the present day. Um, and this can have um, uh, 
strong implications for which wildlife are able to use these green spaces. And the question of how our plant selection really affects habitat for uh, pollinators and songbirds is um, a central theme of my research and, and what I'm going to talk to you about today. And so uh, one of the, the first things I want to discuss is, is why the identity of the plants that you have in your yard might matter from the perspective of first our pollinating insects. And so uh, many folks that are on the call today might be familiar with monarch butterflies, which are um, a, a butterfly that when they're in their larval form as a caterpillar will feed exclusively on milkweed plants. Uh, but what many folks don't realize, including myself, before I started my PhD, um, is that more than 90% of our plant eating insects are specialists to some degree. Um, so our butterflies and our moths, when they um, are in their larval form before they uh, turn into the, our, these beautiful flying insects, they are very specialized to feed on particular host plants for which they've um, adapted over evolutionary time uh, to, um, to overcome those those nasty defensive chemical compounds that are found in leaves, uh, but they also adapt in other ways, such as the plant's uh, phenology or its morphology as well. And so a really great example of this that I like to share is um, this double-toothed prominent, which is um, a specialist of elm trees. And you can see that this caterpillar really fits in very nicely uh, with the double tooth shape of the elm leaf as well. Um, and so we see this again and again across all of our butterflies and moths, this, this degree of specialization. So I want to share with you just a couple of examples that I like that really illustrate this. Um, so the, the really convenient thing about entomologists is that when they name common names for their species, they'll name them after the plant that the butterfly or moth depends on. So here we have the juniper hair streak, which is um, not surprisingly a specialist of juniper plants. Uh, so you can't have this gorgeous, beautiful green butterfly um, unless you have the host plant that this butterfly depends on when it's in its caterpillar form. And, and in this area, they're feeding um, almost exclusively on, on red cedar trees. Um, of course, when the butterfly, uh, um, when the caterpillar grows up and turns into this beautiful green butterfly, then you can plant something like mountain mint, which is a small flowered uh, uh, plant that, um, that attracts this small butterfly. But in order to support a population of juniper hair streaks, you need to have both of those things in your garden. Uh, another example that um, if, if you're tuning in from Massachusetts, uh, you may have seen these around your porch light at night. Uh, they're kind of like um, the entryway to appreciating moths is our rosy maple moth. And as it says in their name, um, they rely on maple trees in order to um, uh, in order to complete their life cycle. And they're this beautiful, amazing pink and yellow moth. It's just you know, this gorgeous little jewel. Um, and although the rosy maple moth can use basically any maple that's out there, uh, we find that when we compare the maples that they that they prefer to feed on or that they prefer to lay their eggs on, uh, they tend to prefer sugar maple over all of the other maples. And so for this particular species, sugar maple is a really important component for supporting populations of rosy maple moth. Another butterfly that you may uh, see in uh, your yard sometimes is uh, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. And they're actually a uh, butterfly that entomologists would consider a generalist species. So if you look in uh, the, the host plant literature, so all of the different um, pieces of literature that say what plants that this butterfly can use, uh, you'll see lots and lots and lots of different plants. Uh, but what, what it turns out is that depending on where you are in the United States, they can specialize on uh, certain host plants over others. So up here in Massachusetts, uh, they use predominantly um, or, or they prefer to use cherry trees. Um, and um, 
as you go farther south into the mid-Atlantic, where I did my PhD work, you find tiger swallowtails on, on a larger variety of, of uh, plant species, such as tulip trees, uh, ashes. And then when you go even farther south to the southeastern United States, um, you'll, you'll start uh, really seeing these caterpillars on a uh, sweet bay magnolia. So that's one of the plants that they really, really prefer. And so they have this sort of regional specialization um, uh, even depending on, on where you are, even though the, the butterfly as a whole can use lots and lots of different plants. Um, so before I go to the next slide, I want to, I want you to get a number in your head real quick. So how, how many, uh, butterflies and moth species do you think that there are in the state of Massachusetts? Um, so get a number in your head real quick. Think about that number and then whatever number that is, I'm going to guess that you're probably wrong because there's a lot of species here. In fact, in Massachusetts, um, there's at least 2,249 different species of caterpillar uh, that have a distribution uh, that includes Massachusetts. Um, but when you see, when you look at how many uh, caterpillar species that each one of these plants support, you see that they're, they're actually quite variable. Um, and so this is actually data from a recent paper of mine that came out where we actually went into this host plant literature. So this again is entomologists that have, you know, just gone out and recorded, okay, I saw this caterpillar on this plant, you know, I saw this caterpillar on this plant. Um, and when we count up the number of species on different plants, we see that at, for Massachusetts, the top performing plants are things like oaks that are supporting 477 different caterpillar species. Uh, cherries are supporting 415. Willows are supporting 406. Just tremendous diversity on these plants. But it's not just trees and shrubs that are supporting high diversity. Our herbaceous flowering plants can also, they tend to support fewer species than our trees and shrubs, but they also seem to have these power players. So um, at least for Massachusetts, and again, this is these are numbers specifically for the state, uh, goldenrod is supporting 131 species, asters at 102, strawberry at 82. Um, so just these particular plants are supporting uh, lots and lots of different butterflies and moths. Uh, but on the other end of the spectrum, we have a whole slew of uh, both native and non-native plants, mostly non-native plants, that aren't supporting very many caterpillar species at all. Uh, so again, this is data for Massachusetts. We have lilacs at 26, uh, ginkgo trees, a very popular urban street tree uh, that supports six. Uh, bamboo one, um, Zelkova, another street tree. You can find that on the um, uh, UMass uh, or the University of Massachusetts campus. Uh, does, it's not known to support any caterpillar species at all. Um, and again, for our herbaceous plants, uh, so I just pulled out some popular ones that you could you could go to Home Depot in the springtime and, and pick up any of these plants like daffodils and cosmos and marigolds and hostas, all very popular, beautiful plants. They don't support any of our butterfly and moth diversity. Um, and so we see this again and again, um, this very what we call skewed distribution, where there's few plants that are supporting most of the caterpillar diversity. Um, and our native plants are supporting most of the caterpillar diversity. And then uh, many plants that are supporting very little um, of our caterpillar diversity and mostly these non-native plants. And so we actually did this where we looked, we took the data like we had in Massachusetts, we looked at this across the entire United States and we found that on average, just 14% of the plants um, that are found in a given state are supporting more than 90% of the Lepidoptera species. Um, and so, uh, when, when we conducted this analysis, we found that some of the top genera that um, that are supporting these butterflies and moths are the same power players were coming up again and again. So things like oak, willow, cherry, pines, and poplar. It doesn't matter if you're in Washington State or South Carolina or in Massachusetts, those are the plants, um, those native plants are supporting uh, most of, of the caterpillar diversity for that region. 
So I talked a lot about butterflies and moths, um, but uh, you may be wondering, are there other insects that are plant specialists? And there definitely are. So uh, flower flies um, are uh, a type of fly that's a very important pollinator species, and they can have very particular flower preferences um, for, for different species. Our beetles, like this jewel beetle up here in the upper right, just tremendous, beautiful beetle, important pollinator. Um, they also can be plant specialists when they're in their larval form. So they feed on just um, certain uh, trees over others. And then uh, many folks are surprised to learn that our bees can also be pollen specialists. Um, and in fact, you know, I, I'm an ecologist, so I really like data. So I wanted to see just how many bees there are. And so uh, fortunately, um, our colleagues at USGS have already um, gotten this information for us. So in the Eastern United States, more than 30% of our native bees are considered pollen specialists. Um, so that works out to be about 120 uh, sp uh, species for the Eastern United States. Um, and when I wanted to see if there were particular plants that were important for our birds as well. And um, it turns out that for bees, um, a lot of times these relationships are one flower to one bee. So here we, you know, here we have um, our fragile dogwood bee, Adrena fragilis. Um, if, if you want to have this particular specialist bee, you have to have dogwood because that's the most important pollen that this bee needs uh, in order to, uh, to feed its brood. Um, but I counted up to see how many specialist bees are found on uh, different plants. And you'll see, again, we're, we're seeing some of these same plants that were important for our caterpillars and moths are also important for bees. So we have willows that are supporting 14 species of specialist bees, uh, dogwoods at four, rhododendron and laurel at four species. Um, and for our herbaceous uh, plants and our small shrubs, we have sunflowers, goldenrods, blueberries, and asters are all supporting 10 to 14 of our specialist bee species. Um, and it turns out that our specialist bees are the ones that are in the most um, dramatic decline. Uh, and in part because they, they don't have their, the plant species that they need. Um, so if we plant the plants for these species to use, our generalist bees will also uh, benefit from those plantings as well. Um, so by some strategic plant selection, um, both for caterpillars uh, as well as for bees, we can start to identify what plants that we may want to prioritize in our landscape if we're interested in creating uh, habitat for pollinators. Um, so that's a lot of information about uh, why native plants and plant identity might matter for our insects. Uh, but uh, some of you may be birders. Uh, you may be thinking, well, I, I don't really care about insects. Um, that's not my thing. I really like songbirds and I want to know why does plant identity matter, but from the bird's perspective. Um, and the reason for that is really uh, quite simple. The reason is that our birds eat insects. In fact, um, our insects are incredibly critical for supporting our breeding bird populations. Um, and again, I'm an ecologist, uh, so I wanted to look at the data and see you know, just how many that might be. And for the United States, we know that at least 440 bird species uh, rely on insects at least in some point in the annual cycle. Um, and the reason for that is that insects are highly nutritious, wonderful power packets of food. And this is especially important during the breeding season when you're growing little baby birds in the nest. Uh, you need to get them the resources that they need in order to grow and to thrive. Um, insects are very important for growing baby birds and caterpillars we see again and again are uh, disproportionately preferred by birds um, that are feeding their young. And the reason for that is that caterpillars have really high protein, which is important for growing bones and for growing feathers. Uh, they have really high calories, so it's an efficient little package of food. It's, it's much more efficient to bring one juicy caterpillar than it is to go searching for five or ten small little spiders. Uh, but caterpillars, because they feed on plants, 
They also have really high carotenoids as well, and carotenoids are important for immune function, um, but they're also important for creating things like beautiful red plumage. So, you know, the carotenoids that make a, 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 a carrot orange, the beta carotene, all of that is just as important for a red cardinal in order to have that, that glamorous, beautiful plumage. Um, and so uh, in this way, um, our bird conservation is really dependent on our insect conservation. And our insect conservation is then built on the foundation of the plant communities that we cultivate. And so these seemingly small decisions that I talked about earlier, like what sort of tree to plant and um, how often to mow and what sort of flowers to have, these small decisions can have really far reaching imp implications for that entire food web. Um, but we really don't have a lot of information um, for what that means for birds and for insects. And so the, the rest of my talk is really gonna focus on, on, on my particular research, looking at this from the perspective of this question, which is really, do you plant native or non-native species? Um, and, you know, this is, this is not a trivial question. Non-native plants are um, incredibly popular. Uh, most of the reason that people choose plants is based on how pretty they are or how easy they are to maintain. Um, but there's increasing interest in also prioritizing ecological service and wildlife habitat. And so these are kind of opposing uh, values. And so if we want, um, and, and especially in urban areas in particular, uh, non-native plants can be extremely abundant and very make up most of the plant biomass that's in an urban and a suburban area. And so if we want to really improve these areas for biodiversity, we need to then ask the question of um, whether these non-native plants are the ecological equivalent of the native species that are being replaced. And so, um, you know, as I share, I shared a little bit of evidence earlier that those non-native plants are supporting fewer uh, species um, of caterpillars and moths, but um, I want to emphasize that entomologists have been looking at this for a long time, and they see this in many different landscapes, in many different habitats across insect species, that non-native plants tend to support lower herbivore diversity, so lower diversity of those plant-eating insects, uh, fewer insect species overall, and especially fewer of our most specialized insects. And so what entomologists had, had suggested is that if we see uh, less diversity of insects, that that would have implications for birds that then rely on those insects for food. Um, but truthfully, this was just uh, an assumption that, um, that many entomologists had made and hadn't been really explicitly tested and not in an urban system um, where uh, there's lots and lots of non-native plants. And so uh, I had the opportunity when I was working on my PhD to really ask this question um, with uh, Doug Tallamy, who's an entomologist at University of Delaware, and Pete Mara, who is an ornithologist at the Smithsonian. Um, and of course, I was the plant nerd that came in to kind of wrap it up, bring it all together. And we really wanted to ask this question of how non-native plants are affecting food webs. Um, and we did this in a really cool program called Neighborhood Nest Watch, which is a community science program through the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center, where we actually, um, we get volunteer householders to join, um, to allow us into their yards to study uh, the ecology of birds in, in urban areas of Washington, D.C., but we also invite them to join us in our data collection. So they get this really unique opportunity uh, to learn about the ecology of their yards and also learn about the process of science as well. Um, and I just want to give a, a, a quick plug here is that Neighborhood Nest Watch is not just in Washington, D.C. It's um, in seven or eight cities across the United States, including Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, so, you know, if this sounds like a project that you might want to be interested in, um, uh, by all means, look up the program and, and see if you can join. And so in, in, my, uh, in my research, most of it really focused on the Carolina chickadee, which is a cousin to your black-capped chickadee. This is the southeastern cousin. Um, and they're really a perfect species to ask these questions because um, they are... Uh, they use nest boxes, so they're really easy to study. They're common in urban areas. 
Um, they're they're very charismatic. I mean, who doesn't like a chickadee? Who isn't excited to see a chickadee in their yard? Uh, but but the most important thing is that insects were more than 95% of this bird's diet during the breeding season. Um, so they they really are prioritizing things like caterpillars and spiders and leaf hoppers. So they're a great model insectivore to look at the effect of non-native plants. Um, and we were we were studying these chickadees in residential yards, and I really want to emphasize that um, all of this work is really focusing on um, very cultivated, very managed properties. They aren't overrun with invasive plants. They're not in the middle of the city, surrounded by pavement. They're your typical single family home, suburban uh, yard. And so um, in each one of our sites, we put up these PVC nest boxes um, to attract the birds to nest. And then our participating householders um, assisted us by really monitoring these boxes for breeding activity. And then that was really fortunate because it freed up my time that I could then ask a lot of supplementary information like following these birds around, looking at their behavior, um, catching them uh, to take uh, um, to measure them and take samples. And of course, we really needed to collect data of really fine scale habitat data on the plants um, that were found uh, in the area. Um, we measured and identified um, all the trees and shrubs that were in this bird's territory using systematic plots um, and also counted lots and lots and lots of insects so that we can understand what insect communities and biomass that were found um, on different trees. Uh, lots, lots of lots of love went into this project to collect a lot of data. Um, and of course, we understand that birds are not limited to a single yard. You know, we had to we had to monitor the whole neighborhood and really uh, get to know everybody that lived there because these birds could could nest in a different tree, in a different nest box. So we wanted to really make sure that we knew whether these birds were nesting there or not. And so um, that that brought us into some really fun situations like this particular bird uh, uh, that lived in Northern Virginia that nested in a mailbox or a newspaper slot for three years in a row. So three years this bird nested in this newspaper slot and they were successful every single year. Um, and so it really goes to show that when when the resources are there, when the birds really want to nest, they will find a way to do it, <laughs> whether there's a nest box or not. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is the part of the talk where I um, define what I mean by native and non-native. And so for the purposes of, of this particular study, um, we considered something native if the plant had a distribution that included the eastern United States. Um, that's a pretty coarse definition. So anything that was from the western United States or another country, we consider that non-native. Uh, that might not be your definition. Um, you may have a different definition, uh, but it's always important that when people are sharing their data or their studies about native and non-native plants, they're very explicit about what their definition is. Uh, the other thing that I want to describe is that in all of our work, we're really we're not interested really in the number of species, the diversity of plants, um, the, or, or the number of trees that are there. We really took fine scale information about the amount of foliage biomass. So in everything that I'm going to share with you for the next um, uh, uh, for the rest of this talk, we're really interested in the amount of non-native plant biomass. And so um, one, of the, one of the questions that we asked for the, with these chickadees is really, um, do native plants provide more uh, food and foraging opportunities um, for these chickadees? And so um, when we looked at our insect data that we found on these native and non-native plants, we found that overwhelmingly our native plants were supporting uh, more caterpillar biomass compared to our non-native plants. And I've done some more analyses since then, and we actually see this across taxa. We see more spiders, we see more ants, we see more all kinds of different insects that birds might be eating. And the only insect species that we find more on our non-native plants are things like scale insects and aphids. And a lot of these insects that birds don't necessarily eat, um, but also are the ones that may be contributing to passing disease around and things that, uh, 
a gardener doesn't want on their plants anyway. Um, so uh, so even though we had more insects on our on our native plants, it's really a more diverse, um, healthy uh, food web um, that's also providing uh, food for these birds. But going beyond just native and non-native plants, we see that uh, so those numbers that I talked to you about before, so this number of caterpillar species that are found on different on, on different plants, I actually then use that to see if that predicted how many caterpillars that we would actually find when we went out and did our sampling. And we see that as the number of caterpillar species that are known to use a plant increases, the probability that we found a caterpillar also increases. And we see much higher, um, we, we found many more caterpillars on our native plants compared to our non-native plants. So the diversity of, a, uh, of caterpillars on a plant is also predictive of the food for those birds as well. Um, you might be wondering, um, you know, what, what sort of non-native plant would be supporting 500 plus species of caterpillar? And the answer to that is what we call um, congeneric species. So these are these are plants that are related to our species, or I'm sorry, these are plants that are related to our native uh, plant species, but are from another, uh, but are not native to this region. So an example of this is here in Massachusetts, we have red maples that are native, but we also plant a lot of Norway maples that are very closely related to our maples, but are found um, in Europe. And so even though hypothetically, Norway maple should support the same insect communities that red maple does, we find that in reality, that's not the case. That's not what we see in the field. We see that these non-native uh, congeneric species are supporting about 40% fewer caterpillars and about 50% fewer species. So they're not the equal ecological equivalent of our natives. Uh, the next question is if these trees are then supporting more food for these chickadees, um, do the chickadees actually recognize that? Do they prefer native plants? Um, and to get at this question, uh, we really wanted to let the birds tell us um, what trees that they liked. And so in order to follow birds around, we use this method called color banding. So we actually we actually capture these birds. We put up these nets. Um, we're all certified in very safe manner. We catch these birds. We apply these plastic color bands to their legs um, so that we can then go out with our binoculars and we can identify, oh, you know, this is blue over yellow silver. Uh, I know that he's the male. I know that he has a nest in this yard. I know he has six young. I know that he, this is his third year coming back to this yard. So it's a really powerful method um, to, to assign an identity to these plants, or these birds, I'm sorry, <laughs> to assign identity to these birds um, so that we can then follow them and see what are they doing? How productive are they? Um, how well are they surviving? Um, and so when we conduct our behavioral observations of these birds, so again, here's my favorite, blue-yellow, uh, his nest, so in this map, his nest is indicated where the star is, and then the darker the blue color, the more time that this bird spent um, uh, foraging. And so uh, you can see that most of his time was spent foraging close to the nest in a black cherry that the um, that the uh, householder had planted. Uh, there was a sweet gum that was planted as a street tree right outside the yard. Uh, they also went to a neighbor's yard and foraged a little bit in this Princeton elm, which is a is a elm cultivar that was um, that was also planted along the street. There were a bunch of willow oaks um, planted along the street. A black walnut that somebody had just like let go in their backyard and and then an arrowwood viburnum shrub that was in somebody's front yard. Um, so you can see they're using, you know, a few different plants um, around the nest, but there's a lot of area of this neighborhood um, that they're avoiding. They're using very targeted foraging towards particular plants and avoiding a lot of the landscape. Uh, so what are these birds avoiding? And you may not be surprised to learn that they're avoiding non-native plants. Um, and so what we found is that these birds overwhelmingly preferred native plants over non-natives. Almost all of our pairs did. M more than 90% or so of our observations were on native plants. 
Um, but, but more interestingly than that is that we found again that this number of caterpillar species uh, from the host plant literature, so the number of caterpillar species that a tree supports was actually a really great predictor for how much those birds like those plants to forage in. So we see this really great linear relationship in native plants uh, where the more caterpillar species they support, the more the birds prefer them. We see that our preferences were much lower in non-native plants and that relationship is much weaker. So these, these plants are really just not reliable uh, foraging substrates for this chickadee and they're really just kind of avoiding them in the landscape. And so why I think this is really valuable is that um, not only are we providing evidence that native plants are preferred by these birds, but also that this number can then be a, a quantitative metric that you can then use to help you make decisions on what sort of plants that you might want to include. So everyone has lots of values. You might want a, a plant for the shade or one that has pink flowers or a big one or a small one. And once you narrow down, you know, these are the plants that I can, I can have. Now, how do you make a decision for which one is good for birds? Well, now you can, you can use these numbers as a means to help you in that decision making. Um, and so we've actually made this information available for people to use. Um, and uh, you can find this on the Native Plant Finder website. It's through the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, you can plug in your zip code and you can look up plants for your area. You can get those numbers to help you make those decisions. You can also do back searching so you can find um, you know, if you're looking for a particular butterfly that you want to have for your yard, you can look up and see what host plant do you need to get that butterfly. Um, you know, my caveat is that this website is still in beta uh, testing mode and so not all the information is there yet, but um, I encourage you to go check it out and see um, how, how, it, how it's doing and, um, and, and let the National Wildlife Federation know that if you found it useful. Um, the other point that I want to make is that while we were studying these chickadees, it was also spring migration. And so um, while the birds are, these chickadees are breeding, all these species, these millions and millions of birds are migrating from uh, Central and South America and traveling thousands of miles to the boreal forest of Canada in order to breed. And so um, we've, they were, we, what we found is that they were using a lot of the same um, tree species that our chickadees uh, were preferring. Um, in fact, by the end of the study, we actually found that um, we documented more than 50 different species of migratory birds that were using residential yards for stopover. Um, so this is stopping over in order to refuel and get lots of fat in order to make that journey. Um, I'm a big warbler fan, so I was really excited that we found 20 different species of warbler that were using these urban yards and also um, numerous species of declining insectivores and species of conservation concern uh, like the Canada warbler, the wood thrush, the morning warbler, uh, scarlet tanagers. So these are birds that don't necessarily breed in urban and suburban areas or even in the Washington DC area but they're using these yards in order to make their migratory journeys. And so um, some of my, uh, uh, we really don't know how well they're doing um, and, and the food that these birds are getting in these urban and suburban areas are critically important for making those journeys. And so, um, you know, my next research uh, that I'm doing currently right now with University of Massachusetts and with uh, the US Forest Service is uh, to look at, at, at these specific migrants um, and which trees that they're using, how well are they finding their food, and I'm doing that in, in Springfield, Massachusetts. So it's a, um, it's a new uh, project that I'm really excited about. Uh, so for the last part of this talk here, um, I, I want to do a, a, one last uh, thought experiment for you. Um, so for these Carolina chickadees, or any chickadee, um, how many caterpillars do you think that it takes um, to make a nest of chickadees? Uh, get a number in your head, think about it. Uh, and the answer is lots. <laughs> it takes lots and lots of caterpillars to raise a single clutch of chickadees. Um, in fact, there was an ornithologist that actually counted up how many that 
there might be. And, and what he found is that these chickadees were feeding 390 to 570 caterpillars per day to a nest of chickadees. Um, and these birds are feeding their young for 16 days until those uh, those baby birds are able to uh, leave the nest uh, and fly on their own. Um, so that's uh, that gets to be 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars that we estimate are required just to raise one clutch of chickadees. Um, and so uh, that that's a little 10 gram bird. So picture picture. Um, 10 paper clips in your hand. That's how big a chickadee, that's how much a chickadee weighs. Uh, it takes that many caterpillars for a 10 gram, gram bird. So how many, how many caterpillars and spiders and other arthropods might it take to raise a cardinal or a woodpecker or a blue jay? It takes tremendous insect biomass in order to keep our bird populations. And so um, the last question that I, that I kind of uh, want to talk to you about that we addressed in this research project is really to ask um, if these birds are preferring native plants uh, and they find more food on native plants, what do they do if those native plants aren't there? Or are there consequences if non-native plants are abundant? Um, and we wanted to ask this question from the perspective of the population um, to see how well these populations of chickadees were doing in these areas. And so in order to monitor populations, we need to collect a lot of different data. We need to collect information about uh, how well these birds are reproducing, uh, how many eggs are they laying, uh, are the males getting females in order to even initiate a nest, how many fledglings are leaving the nest, uh, and in order to get that information, uh, we monitored um, nests from over 150 yards with the help of our participating householders. We were able to gather a lot of information about how well these birds were reproducing. But we also had to get information about how well they were surviving. And so with a 16 year data set of uh, observing these color banded birds, so every year, our, our participants and our technicians would go out and see, did red, yellow come back? Uh, how old is this bird? We were able to take that data and then incorporate that so that we could estimate the probability of a female surviving from year to year. So we can use that in our models. And then the last piece of information that we need is really how well are the young birds surviving. Um, and so it turns out that it's actually pretty difficult to follow a bird after they leave the nest. So we had to use tracking technology to actually put little tags on these on these birds and then follow them after they leave the nest to see how well are they surviving. And then we can take all of that information, we can plug that all together into one model and we can get a sense for how well is this population of chickadees uh, doing. And what we found is that uh, as non-native plant biomass is increasing at the territory, uh, the number of young that birds are producing dramatically declines. And so we actually found negative effects on multiple levels of reproduction, from how well the male attracted a female, to whether uh, how many eggs they laid, how well the nest survived, how many young that they produced. And each one of those effects was actually fairly modest. But then when you put that all together um, and uh, when you compound those negative effects across the full uh, breeding cycle for this bird, then um, then those effects can be quite dramatic. Uh, so, so birds are producing very few young when non-native plant biomass is high. Um, we found uh, no effect of non-native plants on adult survival. Um, and on juvenile survival, but you know that that really makes sense for this species because, like your black-capped chickadees in the winter time, uh, they don't migrate; they stay around, they go to feeders, and so that can help mitigate any uh, negative effects of non-native plants. Um, but what we did find for our juvenile birds is that it really takes a neighborhood to raise a chickadee. So this is another one of those movement maps. And uh, this circle is the area where we did our plant surveys. And what we found is that after these little baby birds leave the nest, they can go up to a kilometer, two kilometers away uh, in order to find the most uh, the plants that have the most insects for them to eat. So and that and that really takes us into some really interesting 
um, situations like the time that I followed a bird uh, to the local Sunoco gas station and I'm out there with my binoculars and I'm looking up in the trees and the owner is like are you here to fix you know the electric and I'm like oh no I'm here for the birds like I'm just staring at your willow oaks uh, but but those birds could do that because they weren't constrained to the nest anymore they can go as far as they need to um, in order to find those trees that are producing uh, the food that they need. And so uh, when we take all that information, we can then plug that into this population growth equation. Um, and I just wanna orient you to this graph real quick. So here at zero is um, what we would say is replacement. So this means that chickadees are producing enough young to sustain a local population. And if, if our numbers are positive, that means the birds are producing more young than the ones that are dying. And if it's negative, uh, then they're producing fewer young um, than the ones that are dying. And what we find is that as non-native plant biomass increases, uh, population growth strongly declines. Um, but you know, we're ecologists and we recognize that we're putting lots of different sources of data into this model. So we wanted to be really transparent about what our uncertainty is in those estimates. And that's really what this gray ribbon is right here. And so um, what we found is that the point that that um, where our confidence fails to overlap zero anymore is at 30% non-native plants. And so what that means is that if you have less than 30% non-native plants, the birds have at least some chance of producing enough young to sustain a local population. But once you get over 30%, that means that the chance of that happening is essentially negligible. And so what we're offering in this paper is that 30% can be a nice threshold that the, we, we can then offer for people as a goal to strive for if they're interested in improving their landscapes for bird habitat. Um, that you really need to aim for less than 30% non-native plants, um, or in other words, having more than 70% native plants. And so when I saw these results, I was actually pretty optimistic. And the reason for that is because in this particular system, um, our average non-native plants is 55%. And so if you think about it, asking people to aim for 30 is really just a gentle nudge in the right direction towards improving our landscapes for bird habitat. It's not gonna require a lot, just cutting down some of those invasives, maybe that ginkgo tree, adding some more oak trees, and you can start really improving your, your habitat for, um, for insectivorous birds. Um, of course, we've also done some work in some new uh, suburban developments in some commercial areas. And in these areas, uh, non-native plants can be um, more than 80 and 90% of the plant biomass. And so uh, there's a lot of potential for residential areas in these, in these kind of landscapes. That's gonna require a much more dramatic change in our preferences and our and our landscaping norms in order to create habitat in these areas. It's not impossible. It's just going to require more effort. And so, uh, just to end here, um, you know, I, I present this data a lot, and I say, let you know, aim for seventy percent native plants. And then people ask me, okay, but what does that mean? And so. I just want to kind of illustrate a little bit about what we sort of mean, and this is based on the average yard size for the Washington DC area, which is much smaller than Massachusetts. So about a 25 meter by 25 meter yard um, with an average amount of trees and shrubs. Um, if you want to create habitat for insectivorous birds, that would mean planting, um, having one to two very large mature trees. So here this, this DBH is a measurement of the trunk size of a tree. So think two very, very large mature oaks, or you could have four large mature trees that um, that are smaller than those oaks. So think about like four or five really big white pines or something like that. Um, or you could have seven medium sized trees like a small cherry or some dogwoods um, that are about 25 diameter in their trunk. 
Um, or you could have 15 saplings or uh, or large or small shrubs that are about 10 diameter in their trunk. Um, or you could have some combination of all of these things. Um, and if you're able to kind of get at this amount of plant biomass in your yard, um, that's a really good step. And if it's all native, that's a really good step towards creating bird habitat. Uh, of course, because when we did our analyses, we did it at a neighborhood scale, it's also gonna require you to talk, you know, to have your neighbors do the same thing. And so uh, the other way that you can really contribute is to not just landscape your yard, but to also talk to your neighbors, let them know why this is important, how they can make, make a difference. Um, and if your yard is larger or if your neighbors aren't interested, then you might have to put, you might need to plant more trees, have more native plants in your yard. But that kind of gives you a little bit of, of an idea of what that might mean for your management efforts at an individual scale. So hopefully if we can all get together, we can create these neighborhoods, we can create habitat for these chickadees. Um, so, so just to finish up here, um, I presented to you a lot of information, uh, but just to kind of recap, what I shared with you today is that plants really vary in their contributions to species interactions, and that depending on what plants you choose, they can support more or less of our insect diversity and potentially our bird diversity as well. Um, in, my, in my studies of native and non-native plants, we found that birds and insects overwhelmingly prefer native plants. And that if you landscape with these native plants um, and you aim for that 70% biomass in your landscape, you can really make a contribution to uh, support insectivorous bird populations at home. And so, um, you know, with that information, I hope you find that useful, but I also hope that it, it inspires you to go out, explore your gardens, see what's living there, because these are all of your, all these animals and plants are all of your neighbors that are sharing your properties with you. Um, and you can have, you can have tremendous biodiversity in your backyard. Um, and it's really fun. It's a really fun park to go visit. It's very easy access too. Um, and if you're interested in kind of learning more about what sort of insects or birds or plants that are in your yard, I encourage you to go check out this website called iNaturalist, which is a really fun website. You can use that to help you identify different plants that you have, different birds. It'll uh, crowdsource help from naturalists all around the world to help you make those identifications. And it's a really wonderful tool to find out what kind of diversity is in your area. Um, so in the end, you know, I hope I, you know, I hope you learned something today. I hope you learned uh, something about how important native plants can be. But I, I think the most important thing that I hope that you take home today is that our gardens really matter. And that those simple choices that you make in your day-to-day -day landscaping um, can really um, make uh, positive contributions towards supporting biodiversity in our most managed landscapes. Um, so with that, uh, you know, if you want to get any more information about this work, you can visit my website. You can download any of my papers there. Um, you're also, please find me on Twitter, hashtag Plants for Wildlife. You can also email me with your questions. Um, and thank you so much for your time. I'll take any questions that you have now as well. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you, Desiree. I know I if know we were in... in an audience, a live audience, everybody would be clapping. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so a couple of questions that came up. Sure. One was recommendations for mowing frequency and the process for maintaining the yard, which may be just weeds as a press. I would like to have some open flat play space. Great. So that's a great question. And it's always important in your landscaping decisions to you know, keep in mind, we have things that we need and values that we want, like playing soccer or having a place for our kids to play. Um, our My colleague at the U.S. Forest Service had a really great study that she conducted here in Springfield, Massachusetts, um, where she actually found that if you reduce the frequency of your mowing to uh, uh, once every two or three weeks, um, that those lawns will support more flowers and then those flowers are going to attract more bees. And so um, 
so that's one thing that you can do is reduce the frequency of your mowing and just a small decision like going from one week to three weeks can can make a difference. Um, the other thing is to really embrace this new idea of cultivating lawns that aren't turf grass. Um, and so there's some really great work from folks in Minnesota and some other places that are incorporating what they call bee lawns or bee tapestries, where you can create lawns that are uh, our native violets, our native strawberries, um, uh, as well as mosses and just different kinds of plants that are incorporated into our lawns um, so that we can have that play space in our open space as well as support plants that aren't, uh, you know, that can actually have ecological function as well. So those are two options that you could consider. Thank you. Um, Paula has a very old sugar maple that is dying, perhaps mm -hmm. with three years left. What large shade tree would be best for her to plant for birds and insects? Uh, you ha so you have lots of choices, especially if you have the room for a tree that can get big. And so, um, you know, in this region, one of the best choices that you can make is to plant an oak tree. Um, oak trees across the board in our work uh, are what we call kind of like a keystone or a foundational tree species. They um, they support lots of butterflies. Uh, birds love to forage in them. They have acorns for uh, for mammals. They um, even even though they're they're wind pollinated, bees will collect their pollen like they just do so many amazing things. They store lots of carbon. Um, so, you know, so that's one choice. Um, uh, another maple tree is another uh, good choice. A hickory is another good choice. Um, there are uh, there are lots of options for you if if you're able to have a large tree. Um, and and that that paper that I spoke about uh, um, earlier that showed that you know few few plants support most of the um, of the caterpillar diversity. We really highlight twenty plant genera that are like these are the ones to go to. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'm sure you can find something that works for your yard, like in in those 20. There's a lot of different choices, from hickories to willows to cherries to birches, all kinds of things. Thank you. The hard thing is going to be deciding, I think, for Paula. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's so hard. <laughs> Desiree, would you mind muting your mic um, oh. when I ask a question? Then I'll I'll mute mine. Oh, sure. Because I think there's an echo. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question that says, how can we get this great info into the hands of the landscape reta retailers? Yes, um, I love this question. Uh, so as an ecologist, I try to make most of my science available um, through multiple sources of media. So, you know, articles and giving talks and we're also trying to put together um, this website. We're in, and one of the projects that I'm really interested in doing is creating kind of a usable database that somebody can get both ecological information, but also aesthetic information about a plant. So you could literally put in like, I want a shade plant with pink flowers that, uh, ha you know, that supports warblers and, and it'll spit out, you know, this is a good choice for you. Um, all of that is down the pipeline. Uh, so the the other thing to really get the hands, I think, in these land, you know, for landscapers, um, for these, you know, our nurseries, our big box stores, is we need more people being vocal. Um, and so if you want native plants uh, or plants that are good for for birds and insects, and you go to your local nursery and they don't have it make a stink about it because when I mean well you know in a nice way because if you put your money where your mouth is if more people are doing that that's going to really encourage people to have these options available um and and to um you know just share the information with with as many people as you can because what I find is for for many people it's not just oh it's not like oh I prefer native plants or I prefer non-native plants a lot of times uh, you know, a lot of the folks in my in my study, uh, they didn't know. They were just like, well, this was what was here or this is what the store sold. And I I bought it. I didn't I didn't 
I didn't know that this wouldn't this would be good for birds or this wouldn't. And when you provide that information, well, this is a good choice. This one maybe is not so much. Um, that helps people have more information in their decision making. Um, so as much as you can, you know, and I, and I try to do the same in all of my work is to get that information out to landscapers and designers so that they can use it to help in their decision making. And we've actually had a couple of projects working with folks that are actually doing new designs for street tree plans and um, a, a, a uh, gardens at zoos and aquariums and there's just like a whole audience of people that are excited about uh, getting the tools that they need to make that decision making and so that's that's what I try to do in all of my work um, and, and I hope that what what you heard today what you learn about I hope you share it so that more people can uh, find out about it and or contact me if they need to. I'm sure you'll have a whole army out there of going to um, <laughs> garden centers and, and speaking our minds. Um, on Dr. Narango's teaching statement, she features a quote that I believe speaks to many of us and attests to the importance and value of her work. It is by Dr. Anurag Agral. Maybe the single most important thing we can do for conservation in general is to give people an appreciation of nature. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I'm sure you enjoyed this program as much as I did. I will certainly head home and look at my landscape through a much more discerning lens and ask the question, how can I make our own backyard more supportive and welcoming to wildlife, to all species, including people? Thank you so much, Desiree, and thank you everyone for joining us. Good night. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good one.